Hi, and welcome to Talking About Success. I'm your host, Jack Canfield, America's number one success coach, chairman of the Canfield Training Group, and author of numerous New York Times bestsellers, including the Chicken Soup for the Soul series, and most recently, The Success Principles, how to get from where you are to where you want to be. And today, I'd like to introduce you to Katrin Jaxtiz, who's a speaker, author, intuitive practitioner, an expert in mental well-being and a trainer of the 2.1 Smile Method who turned a hobby into a successful business. And Katrin is also a loving mother of three grown children, a world traveler, a big dreamer, a truth seeker, and she embodies a lifelong love of learning. Now, Katrin believes that we as a collective people have the potential to create a better world for all of us, and it always starts with ourselves. And Katrin is also currently teaching her signature program, From Fear to Freedom, to students worldwide. Welcome to the show, Katrin. Thank you very much, Jack, for having me. I'm honored to be here. Well, I'm really glad to have you here as well. So now before we dive into the work that you're doing, which I think is incredible, I want you to start at the beginning with us and just give us a little background about your background and, and your upbringing. Share a little bit of that with us so we can get some context from which we'll be developing and moving forward. Very glad to do that, Jack. And if I may, I would just like to start with a little story. It was a Sunday morning, very, very early. My sister and myself were making our way down an endless seeming staircase to the main ground of our home. We were both holding little suitcases and I can still remember exactly what that was looking like. It was red, had golden buckets and had um, black striping around it. I have no idea what was in those suitcases. I just remember holding very tight onto them. Slowly, we made our way down the stairs. At some point, the floor creaked and we were holding our breath, looking to the bedroom door of our parents, and we were wondering, did he wake? Luckily, he didn't, so we continued. Slowly, we made our way to the front door, opened it up, stepped outside, took a deep sigh and thought, finally, we are free, or so we thought. We made our way up into our village and at some point passing a neighbor's house who recognized us that early in the morning, the two six-year-olds uh, just walking on their own. So he invited us in for a hot chocolate and at that time we were already hungry. Gladly took the opportunity, not knowing that by the time we would have finished our cup our father would be there to pick us up. We went into the car, drove home, and our hearts were sinking because we knew what was coming. I grew up uh, as one of three in a small village in northern Germany in a very abusive household. My father was uh, constantly drinking, beating my mother and abusing my sister, my brother, and myself in various different forms. When we are young, we don't really know that this is not the norm. So I assumed everyone around me would live in the same kind of way. The impact it had on us was there for a very long time. But since I'm a little child, I always thought there must be something else. Life can't be just like this. So my main mantra, since I'm very little, was always there must be something else. Now, your, your story and your history includes a lot of grief. I'm just wondering if you could share your perspective on, on grief. We had, apart from this very abusive upbringing, we had some uh, tra traumatic culmination, as I call it, in that lifetime. My twin sister and I were not very close, but my brother, who was always or only um, 11 months older, was really the only friend in my life. He understood me and we were very, very close. At some point, we made friends outside the family and one of our 
friends were um, creating a, a restaurant and on the night before the opening, we were both there helping them, putting the final touches on everything. We had a few drinks, I must say my brother more than I, and he was already 18 and was allowed to drive home. When he wanted to leave, I was fighting with him. I was saying, please don't drive, you had too much to drink. But as you can imagine, I was 17, he was 18. A teenager would not be listening to his sister at that circumstance. And so the last words we shared was in a fighting mode. The next morning, he wouldn't come to the restaurant opening. So in those days, we didn't have cell phones. I tried to ring home and nobody was answering. In fact, the phone line was cut off. I rang someone else close by and they just said to me, come home immediately. I drove home and again, I remember it was one of the most beautiful days. It was the 14th of January, blue skies and we had snow. It looked marvelous everywhere. I drove around the corner to our home and was greeted by black and smoke. My family home had burned down and my brother was in it. And I can tell you, I was not prepared for the pain that I experienced at that time. All the stuff that I lived and experienced up to that point was nothing in comparison to the deep black hole and the physical pain I experienced. I had no support. I was 17 years old. I moved already out. Uh, I didn't have a relationship with my father nor my mother. And I learned over time that what I did in that time, I was swallowing down all my feelings. I was not living that grief. Um, I kind of became a really angry person. And I thought about this morning about grief. And I think what grief really is, it's on the one hand side, we lose somebody we love dearly. So grief kind of is the, the, the opposite coin of loving someone. But what came to me this morning was really grief is also kind of the inability to love completely. So the tap that I sent the love to my brother all the time was kind of turned off and I couldn't release that love anymore. And that turned me into a really angry kind of person at the time. Yeah, well, I think, you know, one of the major stages of grief is anger, that the person has, in a sense, abandoned you, they're no longer there for you. And it's easy to get stuck in that. And so that more vulnerable feeling of the releasing the pain, letting that go, forgiving, allowing yourself to move back into the love from my experience, that's really the, the everything moves us back to that. You know, you, you've developed a method that comes out of your experience from all this and the changes that you've had to make in your life and the journey that you've taken. Can you share a little bit about wh where was that turning point for you? You had an epiphany this morning. I get that, but there something had to happen earlier that allowed you to move to create the program you've created and do the work you're doing. Could you give us some insight into that, that shift? I'm very happy to. As I said at the very beginning, since I was a little child, I always thought there must be something else. And through all the experiences I had after I left home, that journey led me to trying to find this something else in, in different ways. I tried to find it in my career, working up the ladder really quickly. I did read a lot of books. I had some therapy at some point. I also learned a lot about different um, tools and methods over time, went to many workshops, but I only always had temporary relief, nothing that would really stick, nothing that would stop me from still feeling the fear and the anger that I experienced when I was young. I even ran away from it as far as New Zealand, because as you possibly hear from my language, my original country is Germany. And at some point I moved to New Zealand, thinking that's the furthest away I can get from my father and I should be safe. Well, uh, let me tell you, you're always taking everything with you until you confront it. 
And in New Zealand, I met someone who was teaching the two-point method. I went to the workshop and after that workshop, I finally, for the first time, could feel the, like, the energy and the fear and everything that was attached to the memory of my father leaving physically my body. And that's when I knew I had to learn more about this method. So uh, the method itself is ancient and comes from Hawaii and was used by the shaman hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And that method really finally turned my life, my way of thinking and everything around for the better. So talk a little bit about the two-point method and why you think it's so, why, why is it so impactful? Why does it work? In my opinion, it works because it directly connects with our subconscious mind. And many of you will know that the subconscious mind is so much stronger than the conscious mind. So when we are young, in the first few years, we are basically programmed through everything we experienced. And in our subconscious mind, we build a self-image, um, a belief system or a paradigm and certain patterns, how we see this world. On a very easy way to explain this, and um, if you are happy to, I would like you to do that with me, Jack. If you are just taking your hands and putting them together, clasping them like this. And everybody in the audience um, can do that too. So now you take them apart again. This was very natural, that movement, going in and going out. And you didn't really have to think about it. Now you are taking the opposite thumb and putting it, cl closing your hands with the opposite thumb. What you possibly really immediately notice is that you actually had to really think about it um, because it's, the un it's, it's unfamiliar. So this is basically how your subconscious mind is programmed on all levels when you are little. The way you think the way you do stuff, the way you see yourself and the world is all done. And at some point it will play out on autopilot. And the two point method is directly accessing those parts and transforming everything that at this point where you are right now is limiting from experiencing a better life, from experiencing joy or from experiencing freedom. And that's what makes it so successful and so has a lasting um, impact and lasting changes. No, that's, I, I totally agree that that's where you have to go if you want the true transformation to occur. You talk about fear a lot and you believe that fear is one of the things that stops people from living a joyful life. Uh, talk to me about fear and how you address that. Well, fear was um, my best friend in my first kind of 40 years, I should say. But now I have learned over time that how fear develops and what fear really is. So my phrase is always fear is false evidence appearing real. And what does that mean? Well, fear is created in our oldest part of the brain, the limbic brain. And that part is responsible for our survival. And when we are activated in that area, everything else um, is succumbing to that. So there is no logical thinking happening. We will either go into fight, flight or freeze. The next thing to understand with fear is that the majority of time that we in our daily lives uh, who don't really have a lion sitting in front of us wanting to eat us, then fear would kind of make sense. Um, we are experiencing fear from our past memories or projecting our worry into what possibly could happen in the future because our brain cannot distinguish whether we actually are experiencing something right now or whether this was something that happened in the past or might happen in the future. So a lot of us these days are experiencing fear 
or worry. And I would like to again show you three very simple things that you can do when you are activated and triggered in that area. So I would like to invite you, Jack, to do that with me. And everybody who is listening can practice that briefly with us as well. So the, the easiest way when you are triggered is that you focus on your breathing. So you are focusing really in your brain and your thinking, I'm breathing in and then I'm breathing out. I'm breathing in and I'm breathing out. That already is calming your limbic system. If you want to support this even more, uh, Jack, then you take both your hands and are kind of stroking them down your face here like this or down your arm while you fo continuously focus again on I'm breathing in and I'm breathing out. So these simple movements and the breathing is immediately relaxing your limbic system. A third thing, if breathing is not your thing, you can distract your brain by doing something completely different, either running on the spot or, for example, it's a fun thing, spelling your name backwards. Try to think about, even if you do this just in your head, your name Jack Canfield and now spell it backwards. If you do this, your brain has to focus and it cannot focus on two things at the same time. So therefore, you relax and then you can start focusing and making normal logical uh, decisions again. So those are three really simple things everybody can do. Those are cool. I like them. When you're breathing in and breathing out, are you, are you saying to yourself, I'm breathing in, I'm breathing out, or are you just breathing? No, I'm actually saying it so that, because otherwise my mind might be distracted again. So I'm saying to myself, I breathe in and I breathe out. Very cool. Now, I understand you did something to uh, test your own fear, if you were in fear or not, and could you deal with it and so forth. And I understand you did a round the world trip with your three children. You had no no money really. You didn't have a plan of where you were going to go. You just started out the trip to see what if it would all work out. Um, that's pretty brave. I'd like you to talk about that if you would. Yes, this was honestly one of the best things I've ever done in my whole life. I had. Uh, three children or have three children and knew they would be leaving home soon. And what I wanted at the time is first to test how much have I transformed my fears? How much have I learned to trust myself and trust the universe and trust that there's always a solution coming? And I also really wanted to spend some more really intense time with them together, showing them that if they love something dearly, if they really want to do something, they can just follow their heart and can achieve anything um, that is in their desire. So we were going on this world trip and honestly, I had no money. I brought up my kids on my own, so there was no house. I, did, I didn't own a car. Um, we were renting and we were just thinking, how do we um, finance this trip? And we were looking at options. I'm not sure whether you are familiar with woofing in the States, but it's, it's a way that you go to a farm and offer your work in uh, return for some accommodation and some food. So we were looking into these options and I placed a little video on my YouTube channel telling my audience what we were planning to do. And then we did get um, inundated with people saying, why don't you come here and do a workshop? And that's then exactly what we did. So we followed the route for six months, first in Europe, then the States and Canada, and always went where people wanted us to do some workshops. We never knew how many people would attend. We never knew how much money we would make or whether it's enough to go to the next state. 
And we certainly had some ups and downs in that trip, so it wasn't all smooth sailing. However, we learned that the solution is always there. Something will always come up when you are relaxed and when you are trusting. And honestly, it was the best thing for my children and myself that I've ever, ever done in my life. I think it's fascinating you talk about trust because I think one of the opposites of fear is trust. You're either trusting the universe has got your back or the universe is a scary place. And what are you, that the decision you make about whether, you know, it's a scary place or it's operating on your behalf it really changes how you approach life. So I find that fascinating. Now, you mentioned you ran workshops. I know you're currently holding workshops about the two point method. Can you talk a little bit about that work and um, what's the tr transformation that you've seen? I'd really be curious if there's a perhaps a story about a client or someone you've worked with who's benefited from this that would illustrate the power of your, your workshops. Yeah, thank you for giving me that opportunity. There are so many stories um, that I could say, and the majority of people are just releasing some of their very old patterns and fears and become more confident, um, have more joy in life. But there was one story, if you ask me, that motivated me greatly to continue. I was holding a workshop in Canada and there was a lovely lady sitting at the back row and over the whole weekend she didn't ask any question uh, and I was wondering whether she actually enjoyed it or um, whether she was just sitting there because she paid for the, for the workshop. But by the end she approached me and said she would like to have a private session. And of course I agreed. One of the big advantages, in my opinion, of the two-pointing method is that you do not need to talk about any of the so-called problems that I call energy blocks. So none, is, uh, none of um, uh, talking is necessary. However, she wanted to share her story with me. And it took a big um, uh, way of my strength to listen to this without uh, falling into um, yeah, kind of despair. She came from Ireland and she had seven brothers and all her brothers and her father and her uncle over a long period of time were sexually abusing her. And she just, um, yeah, as you can imagine, um, hated men and couldn't really relate to men at all. However, there was some form of divine intervention when she moved to Canada. She met someone and she was already together with that person for three years. But she shared with me that she simply can't be intimate with him. It was just too painful, all the memories. So we did some more work uh, with her and I, um, I assured that she understood the method well enough so she could practice at home. Three months later, she sent me the most beautiful letter uh, thanking me for coming to Canada because she was pregnant. And she wasn't completely enjoying that intimacy at that point, which came later, but she was finally able to actually be intimate with a man who seemed to be a, a saint for having waited such a long time. And so they, they had a beautiful child and they have a very happy marriage now. And that story alone was motivating me to continue because I just was so incredibly grateful that she could turn that life around for the much better. That's beautiful. So obviously a lot of our people watching this are going to want to know how to reach you and, and potentially work with you. How can they do that? Well, I um, have workshops and so they can either come to my YouTube channel, which is just Katrin Yaxtis. And on my YouTube channel, I actually have my basic workshop uh, for free because I believe that everybody should have access to something that can so uh, dramatically and, and bene um, benefit their life. So it's free on there and lots of other really good uh, videos. You also can find my website, Inspire New Beginnings, and I have blog articles, I have 
my um, dates for my workshops or webinars on them. So that's one way to connect with me and work with me. Well, I love that you're offering a free workshop on, on YouTube. That's beautiful. Thank you for doing that for everybody. I know you've also written a book based on your thought that you had when you were really young, that there, there must be something else. I love the title. Uh, tell us a little bit about your book, why you wrote it, and uh, what people can learn from that. Well, when COVID started, I at the time was in Germany and couldn't work anymore. So I thought I used the time to write a book about my journey. The focus of the book, There Must Be Something Else, is really the journey I went through and focuses on the learnings of it. I do believe that all of us have challenges in our lives, every single one of us. And looking at them and seeing them as opportunities for growth and learning something from them and then moving into a, a different um, direction. That was the idea of writing the book. So it's basically my personal journey focusing more on what I learned from all of this. Beautiful. Well, I look forward to reading it. Ketrin, if you had one main message for everyone watching today, what, what would that message be? My main message really is life is a gift. And you are the key to that. All of you have, every single one of you, has the ability and everything that's necessary to change your life for the better. Once you learn to trust your intuition, to trust yourself, to trust life and trust the universe, I guarantee you life will never really be the same. I personally really don't mind which journey you're going to. Find something, find any tool, find any method, find any book, find something that brings you joy and continue on that path because that way you will free yourself from what is holding you back. You will shine your light and by that be an example for everyone around you to do the same. So that would be my main message to you. I agree with all that. That's, I think that really is a main message everybody needs to get. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us before we bring this to a close today? First of all, if I may, I would like to acknowledge my brother and my sister who were a big part of my learning and who have helped me, including my children, to have become the person I am today. I also would like to thank you, Jack, for giving me not only the opportunity to be here with you, but also for the work that you are doing to help people from going from wherever they are to where they want to go. You are, in my opinion, a real sh uh, shiny example and a beacon light for thousands of people around the world. And I would like to thank you for being who you are. If, if I may, I would like to conclude my part with a very short um, Wayata, which is a song from my chosen home here in New Zealand. It's like a little blessing for everybody who is listening, for my family, for you, Jack, and your family, and everybody around this globe. That'd be great. Go ahead, please. Te aroha, te whakapono, te rangi marie, tato tato e. And that means love, hope, and peace for all of us. Mm. So beautiful. Well, thank you so much for this interview. Katrin, I hope it will spur a lot of people to read your book and, and get together with you and, and do the work you're doing. A lot of people have experienced uh, similar tragedies, unfortunately, and, and challenges, and you're a beacon of light as well. Uh, for someone, you're a model for someone who's transcended all that and uh, can help other people do it as well. So thank you again. And I want to thank all of you who have watched today. Please join us again next week where... I will introduce you to another transformational leader who can help you transcend the blockages, the fears, the limitations, 
that you might have and bring you tools and methods and techniques to help you take your life to the next level. And until then, I'd love you to live in love and hope and joy and peace. And uh, we'll see you again next week. Thank you for watching this episode of Talking About Success. Remember, your success is a journey. So for more information and free resources to help you, be sure to visit jackcanfield.com forward slash learn more.